Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Logan's Devotions. It's wonderful to be together. Great to open up God's Word for another day and see what He has to say. We're going to be turning through to the Gospel of Mark, having a look at the beginning of chapter 2. But before I read that, let's come before our Father in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we do pray that you would bless your word to us today. Would you nourish us and feed us? Give us eyes to see wonderful things in your word, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 2, looking at the first 12 verses. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Well, after being in Capernaum for a while, not Capernaum, in Galilee, after being in Galilee for a while, preaching, healing, casting out demons, and then being in the wilderness, taking upon himself the rejection that was due to the leper, which we saw yesterday, we now see Jesus returning home, going back to Capernaum, it says, verse 1. He returned to Capernaum, and it was reported he was at home. So, of course, Jesus returning, the news quickly spreads, the crowds begin to gather, and never a moment's rest for our blessed Redeemer. You can see him there in the house, can't you? Gathered together. Many, many were gathered together, so that there was no more room, not even at the door. So you can picture it, not much social distance happening. Jesus sitting, the disciples there, the scribes there the religious leaders there, and the masses filling up the entire house out the door, and probably a crowd outside longing to come in to be in the presence of Jesus. Now, if it's you in that moment, if you're in Jesus' shoes, what would you do? What does Jesus do? He was preaching the word to them. Now, I've, I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and I will continue to say it as we go through this book. God had only one son, and he made him a preacher. Here is Jesus, surrounded by crowds, and what's the first thing he thinks of doing? Opening up the word and preaching the word. It is central to the work of Jesus Christ, absolutely fundamentally central at the heart of his work is preaching the good news, preaching the gospel, preaching the word faithfully. Oh, how we need preachers. It is not enough for us to have disciple makers. It is not enough for us to have church growth specialists. We need preachers. The church needs preachers, not teachers, not lecturers, but preachers. Men who stand or sit like Christ, pick up the word, open it up, and proclaim whatever is on the text. 
whether it offends or not. And that's what we find in Jesus. People these days, and this is not new, but people want to look on preaching as though it's not enough. It's, it's helpful and it's necessary, but, but it's not the main thing. But for Jesus Christ, preaching is the main thing. And the church needs to recapture that vision. There have been periods in church history where the church has seen the preaching of God's word as the most fundamental aspect of everything in the church. Everything was structured around the preaching of God's word because in the preaching of God's word, God speaks to us. I think of times in Geneva, post-Reformation, where farmers would get up three, four, five in the morning, travel to a morning prayer service where the word of God would be expounded before going out to their farms to do their work. Is that your attitude and my attitude? Do you reflect the crowd? If you're not a preacher, do you reflect, reflect the crowd who says, I must have the preaching of God's word? And on that note, notice the preaching of God's word is always a gathered corporate reality. I've said to people, I don't consider, and this might be a shock to you, but I don't consider when I have live streamed preaching, I actually don't consider that to be preaching. I would liken that more to teaching or lecturing. And the reason I say that, even though I prepare in the same way, is because there is a functionary reality that happens when the people are there and God's spokespeople are there that cannot be replaced. But that's a side note. Notice what happens when Jesus opens up the word. Jesus preaches, the people are gathered there, and these four men, maybe friends of this paralytic, bring this man along. See those four men who have such faith that they look at their friend who is damaged and broken, and they think of Christ, and they say, here is a man who can make our friend well. And they gather, gather him up in their arms, and they, they carry him in on his bed, and they bring him before Christ. They lower him in through the roof. And as he sits there, Jesus looks at him and says, Son, you're well. No. Son, your sins are forgiven. And I can't help but wonder if those four friends went, wait, that's not what we were hoping for. We're wanting him to be made well. And you're just forgiving his sins. You see, we so often focus on the exterior, but Jesus looks into the heart and sees the real problem. The real problem for this man was not that he couldn't walk. His real problem that he was not right with God. He did not know God. His sins barred him from God. And so Jesus came and made him fully well. A wellness that would last into eternity. The scribes are offended by this, aren't they? Who is this man? Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they're right, aren't they? Only God can forgive sins. I can't utter your sins are forgiven. Only God can forgive your sins. It's blasphemy for me to think that I can forgive your sins for you. Only God can do that. Is Jesus a blasphemer? Jesus shows beautifully in response that he's not understanding their question he says why do you question in your heart which is easier to say to the paralytic your sins are forgiven or to say rise take up your bed and walk and in order to show that he has power to forgive he says to the man get up and the man gets up takes his bed and walks out the door why is this here you see jesus is showing us but mark is showing us of jesus that jesus is god you see they were right only god has the power to forgive sins and what Jesus does in that moment is confirms that he is God. Here is God forgiving the sins of the paralytic and making him whole to prove it. And what's the glorious outcome right at the very end in verse 12? All were amazed and glorified God, saying we never saw anything like this. You see, here we see the primary function of Christ. He comes to preach. He comes to set people free. And he does it in order to bring the glory of God to its most height. And this is the work of the church. The church is sent forth to preach the word. To declare the works of God. To call sinners to repent and be saved. And to see 
God glorified. So let me ask you, what are you doing to be a part of the church's great mission to disciple the nations, to call them to repentance, and to see them amazed with God? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for Jesus. We pray that you'd help us. Help us to be amazed by him every single day, like this crowd was. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining me for another day. I'll see you back here tomorrow afternoon.